This is a video on how I built this bubble light tube. When I first came up with this idea, I wanted to build a large floor standing one, but after a little thought, decided on a smaller prototype first. In a future video, I will be building a large version of this. This video also shows how I lost $250 in a few milliseconds. When you see what happens, this will make a lot more sense. So, let's get started. For the bottom plate, I am using quarter inch acrylic. The size will be 10 inches square. I start by taping the bottom of the plate. This is so I can draw the tube sizes onto it, as well as mark the division of the circle for the bulkheads. After finding the center of the plate, I drill a 1 16th pilot hole. Then using a compass, I draw a five and a half inch circle. This is the diameter of the large tube. I want to divide the circle into six equal parts. To do this, I use the compass to measure the radius, then use that distance to mark each side of the center line. I then draw a line from these points through the center of the circle. Using the compass, I now draw a two and a half inch circle. This will be the position of the smaller tube. Now I mark the center between the two circles on each of the six divisions. These will be the positions of the bulkheads. With all the positions marked out, I drill pilot holes using a 1 16th inch bit. Since the stems on the bulkheads aren't long enough, I am countersinking holes using a 5 8 inch Forstner bit. With the countersinking done, I will drill 1 quarter inch holes. Using a 7 8 inch bit, I'm drilling a hole in the center of the plate. This will be for the square tube that will hold the LED lights. Since the remote for the lights uses infrared, there needs to be a hole for the receiver. For this, I am using a half inch bit. Yes, I know, more holes. These are the last ones, I promise. They will be used to screw the bubble tube onto the base. For the last step on the bottom plate, I will be spraying a frosted paint. The side I will spray is the opposite side to the countersink holes. The color of the frosted glass paint is sea glass. I will cut the smaller tube at 29 and 3 8. Using 180 grit sandpaper, I sand the tube ends until the saw marks are gone. Off camera, I centered both the tubes in place. Then I used tape to mark their position. After I remove the tape for the small tube, I will bond it onto the bottom plate. To do this, I am using a product called Weld On 4. It is a water thin solvent that will wick between the joint, causing a chemical reaction that melts and merges the acrylic pieces. The bond forms quick, but will take a couple of days before the joint is fully cured. To make sure there is good contact between the two parts, I add a weight. After a couple of hours, I can remove it and continue working with the piece. Now I will be adding the bulkheads. To ensure a good seal, I use an O-ring on both the top and bottom side of the plate. I then add a washer before tightening the bulkhead in place. For the light tube, I am using one and a quarter inch square tubing. I cut the length at 29 and a quarter inches. I then sprayed the light tube with the same frosted glass pane as the bottom plate. 
Using some cabinet door bumpers, I'm sticking them to the top of the small tube. These will be used to support the light tube. Since there is a little space between the cabinet bumpers and tube edge, I'm using a product called Instant Bond to secure the light tube in place. Using the same product, I am gluing the light tube to the bottom panel. Now I will be adding the LED lights to the inside of the square tube. I cut them at about 40 inches, which will leave enough light for inside the base. Keeping the LED strip in the center of the square tube, I glue it in place. To splice all the LEDs together, I'm using some T-shaped strip connectors. I thought I might have to solder all the connections until I found these. When connecting them, I made sure the exposed copper slid under the pins, as well as keeping the polarity the same down the line. Here's an illustration of the wiring schematic. To make a cap for the small tube, I am cutting out a piece using a 3 inch hole saw bit. After a little sanding, I will be ready to bond the cap onto the tube. To bond the cap, I will use Weld On 4. I then add some weight. Now that the small tube is finished, I will start preparing the large tube. First, I cut the length of the tube at 30 inches. Then using 240 grit sandpaper, I start sanding off all the saw marks. Also, I will sand both sides of the tube. I am now ready to bond the large tube onto the bottom plate. First, I will remove all the tape. Using the same method as when bonding the smaller tube, I apply weld onto the joint on the large tube. When using this type of applicator, I squeeze all the air out, then stop squeezing when moving toward the joint. This will prevent any dripping. As with all the other joints, I add weight. Now I will be making a cap for the larger tube. Using a large tube cutoff, I trace the circumference onto some 3 16 acrylic. Now I will trim around the circle using both the table and miter saw. After that, I will use a disc sander to smooth out the corners. Now with the cap finished, I will bond it to the large tube. Here are the parts that will make up the airflow to the bubble tube. Instead of using a single aquarium pump, I am using three of these mini pumps. What I love about these pumps is they are virtually silent. I am also using fuel line check valves. I have found when using the cheap aquarium valves, the tubing would sometimes slip off. If this happens, the water would drain out of the tube and into the base. So well worth the extra cost. I will leave a parts list below. Now I will attach the tubing to the bulkheads.
With that complete, I now test for any leaks. After running the bubble tube for a few hours, everything is dry. Now that the bubble tube is complete, it is time to start on the base. To begin with, I cut strips of plywood to build boxes. There will be a total of three, each at a different height. The bottom will be one and three quarter inches, the middle two inches, and the top will be three and three quarter inches. All the boxes will be 10 inches square. I will cut two pieces of each group 10 inches and two pieces nine and a quarter inches. Since the plywood is three quarter inch, when they are assembled, they will be 10 inches square. The first level will have the power cord and switch, so I need to drill a couple of holes. I am drilling this hole using a three quarter inch bit and this one using a one inch bit. I am now cutting the bottom for the lower box. Here I am cutting quarter inch thick acrylic to be used for the light fins. I will need two of them, each at 13 and a half inches square. I am now drawing out the area that needs to be cut out, which will be 8 and 7 8 inches square. I have tried a few different blades for cutting acrylic, and found the Trex blades works quite well in producing a clean cut. I now use the jigsaw to finish the cuts. The blade I use here is one for cutting metal, which seems to work okay. I will sand the inside edge from 180 grit to 320. The outside edge I only sand to 220 grit. After a quick paint job, I will move on to installing the light fins. But before I do this, I want to place an acrylic mirror on the bottom of the base. This will help reflect the light up to the bottom plate. Now anybody who has a saw stop or is familiar with one might see what is going to happen here. I didn't. You gotta be f***ing kidding me. If you missed it, let me slow it down to 5% of normal speed. Anyone not familiar with the saw stop, let me explain what happened. The saw has a safety system that will prevent severely damaging or losing a finger. Basically how it works is when anything conductive, such as the human finger, touches the blade, there is a signal change that will activate the aluminum brake. This happens in a few milliseconds. Since the acrylic mirror that I was trying to cut has conductive material, it activated the brake. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that I lost $250 in a few milliseconds. This is why. When the brake is triggered, it pretty much destroys the blade, and of course the brake. Even though this is a great safety feature, I still treat the saw as if there wasn't one. Anyways, back to the project. After turning off the safety feature, I cut the acrylic mirror to fit in the base. So if you were wondering, yes, you can turn it off. After applying some JB Weld to the back of the mirror, I placed it into the base. Now I will be attaching the light fin onto the plywood. For this I will use screws, so I need to drill holes in the acrylic. I will first countersink holes using a Forstner bit to keep the screw head flush. Then I drill through using a 1 8 inch bit. After using a jig to position the light fin, I add weight to keep it from moving. Then I screw it in place. At some point in the build, I will need to screw on the maple bottom, so I am drilling holes into the acrylic mirror to allow for this. Here I am marking where the screws are for a reference later, 
I am now countersinking holes to be able to screw the second layer onto the acrylic fin. Using tape as a guide, I am drilling down one and a quarter inches. Before screwing the second layer on, I make sure it is flush with the first layer. Once in place, I clamp it to keep it from moving out of position. Using a 3 16 inch bit, I am drilling through the acrylic fin. I then screw the second layer onto the first. Attaching the second light fin and third layer is identical to the previous ones. The only difference is the third layer is deeper and required further countersinking. Now that the basic structure of the base is complete, I now move on to installing the lights. Fortunately, the width of the LEDs are slightly less than a quarter inch, so they fit nicely in the groove. To keep them in place, I'm using duct tape. At this point I wasn't exactly sure how this light effect would turn out, so I was quite relieved that it looked more or less what I was hoping for. Now I will start to work on the trim work to finish off the base. For this I will be using a combination of maple and cherry. For the bottom of the base I am using maple, which is from a shelving unit I had. The size will be 13 and a half inches square. Here, I am routing the edge with an eighth inch round over bit. I then sand off the old finish. After cutting another 13 and a half inch square piece of maple, I will be removing the middle section. This is similar to the light fins, except the inside measurement will be slightly more than 10 inches. I'm routing this edge using the same 1 inch round over bit that I used on the bottom piece. The corners for the base that I am using are 3 8 inches thick. Since the side panels need to be the same thickness, I'm planing down some 4 quarter cherry. I am now cutting the side panels. The sizes are 1 and 3 quarters for the first level. 2 inches for the second level, and 2 and a quarter inches for the top level. To determine the width of the side panels, I place the corner molding in place, then measure the distance between each side. Using a 7 8 inch bit, I am drilling a hole for the power switch. The one I am drilling here is for the power cord. I will now be attaching the maple bottom to the base. Using a jig, I center the base onto the bottom. After waiting a couple of hours, I will then screw it down. The next step is to install the corner pieces. After getting some measurements, I cut the molding to size. At the same time that I am gluing in the corner molding, I am also cutting the side pieces. Once I get the correct size, I will mark it for later reference. With the corner molding installed, I move on to gluing in the side pieces. Since they are all pre-cut, this shouldn't take very long. For some reason, before I finished installing the side panels, I decided I should move on to the electrical. I don't know, if it was me I would have finished the panels first, 
but who am I to criticize? Back to gluing. Now, as I said before, the panels are all pre-cut, so it shouldn't take too long. That is, as long as I don't get sidetracked again. I am now nailing in the second to last molding. I'm not worried about nail heads here, as they will be covered with the final trim piece. I had to do a little back and forth here between the saw and base to get a corner joint that I was satisfied with. To attach the final piece onto the base, I will be using JB Weld. To make sure I don't get epoxy on any of the finished parts, I tape off the area around the top trim piece. Now that the base is finished, I am moving on to building the top for the bubble tube. Using a five and a half inch hole saw, I am cutting a piece that will slide over the top of the tube. I am cutting this maple so that the hole is in the center of the piece. The final size of it will be seven and five eighth inches square. I cut this maple at nine and five eighth inches square. It will fit on top of the first piece. On the 9 and 5 8 inch piece, I am measuring the center distance between the small and large tube. This will be for an air vent. At that measurement, I am drilling a 1 and a quarter inch hole. Now with the finishing done, I will glue the two top pieces together. The last step of this build is adding an air vent. I cut a one and a quarter inch tube slightly larger than the thickness of the maple top. I then sand the tube using 180 grit sandpaper until it is flush with it. I then give the tube a final sanding using 320 grit sandpaper. Now I need to drill a hole into the top of the large tube. I first add a couple of layers of tape. Then using a one and a quarter inch bit, I mark the center of the hole. Then using a three eighth inch bit, I drill a hole for the air vent. With the hole drilled, I will now bond the air vent tube to the top of the large tube. This now completes the build of the bubble tube light. The next step is to make some adjustments to the airflow, then attach the two pieces together.